When I was growing up, the Democrats were a left-of-center party, but they had a lot of moderates and they had a conservative wing. Republicans were a right-of-center party, but they too had moderates and they had a liberal wing. We now have a liberal lump and a conservative lump and the middle's gone. The Democrats have pretty much shed their entire conservative wing. Republicans have pretty much shed their entire liberal wing. Parties have polarized much more than they used to. Sorting has led to a renationalization of American elections. Why do we have the unstable majorities? In this era, we have two highly polarized parties. They respond to their base pressures. If you're a Democrat, your pressures are coming from the left. If you're a Republican, your pressures are coming from your right. To satisfy these base pressures, they take relatively extreme positions, and they emphasize issues that are priorities of the base, but not priorities of the general public. That activists tend to often be motivated by things that are important to them, but not important to the electorate at large. This alienates your marginal supporters, the people who say, well, I didn't really vote for that. You're, you're a genuine millennial. I'm like the very tail end of the millennials. I get to technically slide in right under the wire. Yeah. You're a millennial millennial. How old are you? I am 24. Okay. So it's still okay to ask me that. I'm young enough where it's not. Right, it's not insulting. Yeah, like exactly. I, I knew that it wasn't <laughs> insulting, so I could ask you that. Well, I mean, economically, the way living in Asia has shaped my point of view. I mean, I, I've lived in Singapore and Shanghai and Hong Kong, obviously very economically prosperous country places and cities. Uh, but I've also visited places like Thailand and Indonesia, which are developing countries. So my background, what it means to me is that I understand what actual poverty looks like. Not, you know, millennial, I have college loans, therefore I think capitalism is broken type poverty. So I think that perspective has been really important to me. You know, growing up, obviously, I've been mixed race the entire time. There's never a time <laughs> where I was not mixed race. It's just been part of my reality. It was never something that I really thought about. I never thought it was strange. It was just like, yeah, my mom's white and Canadian. My dad's Chinese. It, it is what it is. I'm both. Uh, so let's talk about your religious background because you used to be an atheist. Now mm -hmm. you're a religious person. So what's your religious background? Um, so I grew up in sort of like a Christmas Easter Catholic household. I mean, I would have said that I was Catholic. I, I went to Bible studies when, when I was a kid. I you know, drew like crayon Jesuses. I have memories of that. But ultimately, like I can never remember like really having any th deep religious thoughts or spiritual thoughts. And that was kind of me younger than growing up. I, when I was 13, I remember I, I started this like angsty atheist phase. I was reading like Richard Dawkins and I just thought I knew better than everybody. Like, yeah, all of these religious scholars from like thousands of years ago, they don't know what I know. Okay. I'm a 13 year old atheist. So pretty big deal. So that was me. And I really thought that I knew better than everybody. Um, and I, I was quite obnoxious during those years. But as I got older, I started to be interested in philosophy a little bit more. So I started reading people like Plato and Aristotle. And it's funny, I actually became sort of a, a deist before I circled back to Christianity at, at all. But, you know, theories like the uh, theory of the cave, unmoved mover, it made me start questioning things. And it's not, you know, there's this belief that if you're religious, you're anti-science. I'm not anti-science, but I think ultimately science is the how, but not the why. We can believe in the Big Bang Theory, but still think, okay, well, then what was the catalyst for that? Then what was before that, right? Because ultimately science is not it's not a system that can explain to us anything qualitative or explain why. Um, so I, I started to be a little bit more open to the idea of a creator God. And then as I got a little bit older still, I started exploring things like, uh, you know, St. Aquinas. And I got more interested in the Bible. And what's interesting about Christianity is that if you believe in the ultimate good, like the theory of forms, which I, which is... Uh, a big, a big part of my like philosophical belief, even now, um, you you can't help but recognize that human beings or the world around us, we fall short in so many ways of attaining that perfect, that ultimate good. Um, Christianity, and really, um, it's the backbone of I think all Abrahamic religions. They recognize that fault and they try to find a solution to it. Like, why are humans falling short? What can we do to become perfect? Because I think, I mean, ultimately, the the trouble that I think a lot of atheists have is that they recognize that w we aren't perfect, that society isn't perfect, but they don't have an answer for it, right? Oftentimes the answer is, okay, well, maybe more government, that will make us perfect. Or, um, you know, maybe maybe this medicine, this drug, then will be perfect. They, they're trying to find all of these solutions, but I think ultimately um, Christianity for me is the only, only philosophy or theology where I can say that makes the most sense. And so that 
when I was uh, 16 or 17, I became a born again Christian. And I think since then it's been, you know, you always try to grow in your faith, but it's, it's, you know, it's a struggle. You go back, you go forward sometimes. And I, for the most part of my channel, I, I never really talked about being a Christian. And I, I only really started talking about it fairly recently because I, I realized that there are so many people out there and this, this is kind of depressing who have such a negative view of religion or religious people. And the, the United States, the West in general, is still a majority um, of people profess some sort of religious affiliation. But if you were to, I guess, judge things based off of YouTube or Twitter comments, you wouldn't know that. You would think you know, they're the minority and that everyone's an atheist. So for me, talking about things like religion, spirituality, or faith, it's, it's a way to try and at least, this is going to sound weird, but normalize it. Because there are so many young people, millennials especially, who have had no exposure to any type of religion. So they're very much of the belief that religion is bad. Religion makes you stupid. Uh, if you're religious, that's because you've never opened a science book. Like, evolution exists. Checkmate, theists. That kind of thing. So that's what I'm trying to push back on. I, I really like that you talk about your faith as well, because no one can call you stupid, right? I mean, people can call you wrong, but they can't call you stupid. Well, they try anyway, but thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. So I don't know how much more upfront I can be about it. So I, I've kind of just, I, I, I tune it out, because I think there are people that want to engage with you honestly and there are people who don't and I've learned that if someone is just keen on calling you a Nazi there's not really anything you can do to move it's a badly that. motivated argument you can see yeah. it now being used in mainstream circles they've, they've brought up this this ridiculous study that suggests that because all of us are on YouTube basically and because there are a lot of us who are popular on YouTube if people watch a bunch of those videos eventually they fall down a rabbit hole a yeah. small minority of them and that that is somehow the fault of Dave Rubin or me or Jordan Peterson or Joe Rogan or you uh, and that's really an attempt to just fringe out anybody who is having conversations in any way, even critical conversations that need to be had. Uh, and, and more importantly, they don't care about fringing out Richard Spencer, who's fringed himself out. They care about fringing out mainstream popular figures who happen to be heterodox mm -hmm. because Jordan is not necessarily conservative. Joe Rogan certainly is not conservative. Dave Rubin is a classical liberal, as he likes to call himself. And yet there's this move to try and shrink the Overton window so that everybody who is not a Hillary Clinton supporter or Barack Obama supporter is outside that Overton window now. Yeah. And that's what's frustrating to me is that, I mean, like with the whole Christchurch thing, everyone was going after the right wing um, because it's hashtag not all Muslims, but it is hashtag all right wingers, uh, conveniently. Um, and they, they spent a lot more time demonizing figures like you or Jordan Peterson than the actual white nationalists. And that's always so, so funny to me is that, I mean, it, let's say for some, whatever, we can say that, you know, this Orthodox Jew is uh, leading people toward the alt-right. Wouldn't that still lead you to criticize the actual alt-right more? And they just don't. I, I, I don't know why that is. If, if they find these ideas so repugnant, then shouldn't you be actually criticizing the people who are espousing them, taking apart white nationalist arguments, not just conservative arguments, but they really don't spend any time doing that, which is, I mean, you and, you know, Michael Knowles with his video for prayer, you, you guys have spent more time denouncing the alt-right than they have, like the actual alt-right. Yeah, no, it is pretty amazing. And Jordan, too. I mean, there, there are a number yeah. of us who have spent an enormous amount of time fighting white nationalism. But if there's a convenient way to fight back against people they don't like, then they will use mm -hmm. any club at their disposal. And it really is uh, fundamentally dishonest. You know, it's funny to me for all of the complaining that feminism does about how rapey, misogynistic Western culture is. If we actually look at Hollywood culture or, you know, hip hop or rap culture, that's where women are being objectified, right? It's not the Christian conservatives who are uh, objectifying women. It's, I mean, watch any rap video and you're going to see a lot more objectification than something that happens on like the Christian news network or whatever. So that, that to me is a huge, huge double standard. I mean, these feminists, they're happy to complain about people like Mike Pence, but then they'll have, you know, all these hip hop artists, people like Jay-Z campaigning for Hillary Clinton as if they're some great, you know, respecters of women, which is absolutely not true. So, I mean, I don't, I don't think the, the progressive movement, the feminist movement actually cares about respecting women. Uh, I think they care about being anti, uh, you know, religious conservatives whenever convenient. Things like solar, there's been a lot of developments in solar energy in the private sector that make it very appealing for individuals just to because of you know their own interests or their own budget install in their own own homes uh, i think conservatives should be trying to encourage people in you know free market private enterprise types of ways to do what they can as individuals to combat climate change because otherwise you know if if the democrats are the only people talking about it then i think a lot of especially young people are going to think that if you want to do something, anything for the planet, then you have to vote for them because Republicans don't care, which I don't think is true. There are a lot of Republicans who do care about the planet.
the time finally comes for Bernie Sanders to come clean. If you had to describe Bernie Sanders's campaign, Bernie Sanders's entire political career in just one word, how would you describe it? Billionaires, millionaires, 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 millionaires and billionaires at the same time. Millionaires and billionaires, 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 millionaires and millionaires. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Enough is enough, Bernie. Enough of the lies. Guess what? It turns out Bernie Sanders is a millionaire. Of course he's a millionaire. He did an interview with the New York Times and he says that now as he's preparing to run for president in 2020, he is finally going to release 10 years worth of his tax returns. Now you might say, Michael, Bernie Sanders ran in 2016. They all made such an issue about the tax returns. Surely Bernie Sanders has already released his tax returns, right? Wrong. No, no, no. As with everything when it comes to socialism, it's always different rules for you than they are for me. Tax returns for thee, but not for me. So Bernie Sanders while while he's been running for president now since what 2015 basically nonstop, he has released not even one tax return. He released a two-page summary of one year of his tax returns. That's all we know about Bernie's tax returns right now. By the way, I don't care about tax returns. I don't care at all what any of the candidates have done in their tax returns. It does not interest me in the least. I don't think candidates should release their tax returns. Uh, there's just no reason for it. Now, why don't I care? I don't care because I don't care if you're really wealthy and want to run for office. I think that's a noble thing that you made a lot of money and then decide that you're going to stop making money for a period of time. You're actually going to lose some money to serve your country. I think that's a wonderful thing. I don't ever discourage rich people from running for office. Now for the Democrats, of course, for especially for socialists like Bernie Sanders, they ostensibly hate when wealthy people run for office. They're oligarchs. They're millionaires. They're billionaires until it turns out that you're one of those millionaire, billionaire, plutocrat oligarchs as well, aren't you, Bernie? So now the Democrats have made tax returns a big deal. Bernie Sanders is in this corner. He has to release his tax returns. So he's now trying to let it leak a little bit slowly. Bernie is a millionaire. I always knew Bernie was a millionaire. Uh, there were a number of reasons. In a very personal way, I know that Bernie Sanders has three houses, he has three homes. It's hard to have three homes if you're not a millionaire. I guess by definition, you're a millionaire, especially where Bernie Sanders is living, if you have three homes. But the excuse is what's really incredible. So he says, I'm a millionaire. Yes, I'm a millionaire. Quote, I wrote a best-selling book. If you write a best-selling book, you can be a millionaire too. But how come that's okay for Bernie, but it's not okay for other people? How come it's okay when Bernie makes a million dollars on the private market, or in the open market rather, in private enterprise, but it's not okay when other people do? It's okay if you write a best-selling book, then it's okay to be a millionaire. But if you start a company that makes widgets, then it's not okay to be a millionaire. If you're a plumber who has a successful plumbing company, then it's not okay to be a millionaire. If you work in finance and you add liquidity to markets, then it's not okay to be a millionaire. Sanders then continued, he said, listen, healthcare isn't free, except that he keeps promising everybody it's going to be free, so there's that. It will drive up taxes to pay for healthcare, and not just the wealthy will pay for that, the middle class oh, will also okay. pay for Very it. Very good. So how do you justify it? And All right, Martha, what are you not including in your discussion? You tell me. I will tell you. You're not going to pay any health insurance premiums. <laughs> You're going to pay one way or the other. But look, Martha, pay one way the other. Martha. Whether it's in your income oh, tax or your payroll tax, you're right. going to pay. Look, health care is not free. You never heard me suggest that we're going to match. You just said it was going to be free for everyone. It's going to be free at the point of when you use it. Okay, it's free at the point when you use it. That, that, that's idiotic. I mean, that, that, that means it's not free. Today, many Americans don't like capitalism. Socialism would be better, they say. Not repressive Russian or Venezuelan socialism, but democratic socialism, like what's practiced in Scandinavia. I think we should look to countries like Denmark, like Sweden. Say, so, well, do you want to be like Sweden? Kind of. 
Sounds pretty good. People interviewed in this just released PBS documentary say America should be more like Sweden. It seems like it's like a place that like no problems or something. Uh, it is a socialist economy. Volvos and uh, socialized medicine. Uh, Volvo is now a Chinese company. Welcome to Stockholm, Sweden. My name is Johan Norberg, and this is where I was born and raised. Johan Norberg made this documentary because he wanted to set the record straight. Sweden is not socialist because the government doesn't own the means of production. To see that, you have to go to Venezuela or to Cuba or North Korea. But we did have a period in the 1970s and 1980s when we had something that resembled socialism, a big government that taxed and spent heavily. And that's the period in Swedish history when our economy was going south. So much so that even the socialists complained about the high taxes. Astrid Lindgren, who wrote the very popular children's books, Pippa Longstocking, for instance, she, she was a social democrat, but she had made a lot of money from her books. But she found that she paid 102% in taxes. She wrote this angry essay about a, a witch uh, who was quite mean and vicious, but not at all as vicious as the Swedish tax authorities. And yet even though taxes were high, they did not bring in enough money to fund Sweden's welfare state. There were waiting lines to get health care. People couldn't get the pension that they thought that they depended on for the future. At that point, the, the Swedish population just said, enough, we, we can't do this. Sweden then reduced government's role. They cut public spending, privatized the national rail network, abolished certain government monopolies, eliminated inheritance taxes, and sold state-owned businesses like the maker of Absolute Vodka. Lower taxes um, reformed the pension system so that it wasn't unsustainable. The results from the spending cuts and privatization? This impoverished peasant nation developed into one of the world's richest countries. All I hear is that Sweden is this socialist paradise. We do have a bigger welfare state than the U.S., higher taxes than the U.S., but in other areas, uh, when it comes to free markets, when it comes to competition, when it comes to free trade, Sweden is actually more free market. That free market pays for Sweden's big welfare programs. Today, our taxes pay for pensions. You call it social security. For 18-month paid parental leave, Government pay childcare for working families. But having the government manage all of these things didn't work well. So we had to manage it in another way. They privatized. We realized in Sweden that with these government monopolies, we don't get the innovation that we get when we have competition. And this is particularly true for the school system. Sweden switched to a school voucher system that lets parents pick their kids' school and forces schools to compete. And the, one of the results that we've seen is not just that the private schools are better than the public ones, but even the public schools in the vicinity of private schools, they often improve because they have to. Sweden's version of social security was going broke. So Sweden privatized that too. Privatize the pension system, that terrifies people. And obviously that scares people, but when they realized that the alternative was that the whole pension system would collapse, they thought that this is much better than nothing. Now, the bulk of pensions is really contribution defined. So if things are going well for Sweden, pensions are increasing. But if things are going less well, pensions are automatically lowered, which basically takes away from politicians the ability to buy votes by just promising higher pensions and letting future generations pay. And when it comes to taxes, what Sweden does may surprise you. The low-income earners in Sweden pay a lot more than low-income earners in America. So despite the fact that Sweden looks like sort of a socialist country which taxes the rich exorbitantly high, the truth is the opposite. People who earn below average income pay up to 60% in taxes. This is the dirty little secret about the Swedish tax system. We don't take from the rich and give to the poor. We squeeze the poor because they are loyal taxpayers not taking more from the rich, school choice, privatization. Sweden is anything but socialist. You can't turn your backs to the, um, to the well, uh, to the creation of wealth. You can watch the full documentary, Sweden Lessons for America, at freetochoose.tv. If I pay taxes for something, that makes it not free. 
I love that Bernie Sanders has been getting away with this for a while. Martha McCallum calls him on this and Sanders simply falls apart. This wasn't the only point at which Sanders fell apart. The most amusing point at which Sanders fell apart is he was asked, OK, you know, Bernie, you make a lot of money. And he does. He's been making about a million dollars a year for the last several years. And he was asked specifically, OK, well, you know, you could just pay extra taxes. So why aren't you paying the extra taxes? And Bernie Sanders had no good answer to this because, of course, if you are a socialist and you want the government to have more money, you could do this. Your taxes do show that you're a millionaire. You did make a million in 2016, 2017. You're right, the 561 in 2018. But your marginal tax rate, tax rate was 26% because of President yeah. Trump's tax cuts. So why not say, you know, I'm leading this revolution. I'm not going to take those. <laughs> Come on. But there he, I am... I paid the taxes that I owe. And by the way, why don't you got Donald Trump up here and ask him how much he pays in taxes? Yeah. Would you be willing to pay 52% on the money that you made? Oh, you can volunteer. You can send a check. Oh, you can volunteer, too. We have a... But you suggested, have, right. you suggested that uh, that's hey, what everybody in your bracket should do. And Martha, why don't you give? You make more money than I well, do. Why I don't didn't, you I give? didn't suggest a wealth tax. And she's not running for president. And All right, but we're going to... OK, it is, it's hilarious to me that Bernie Sanders is saying to Martha McCallum, well, why don't you pay more in taxes? Why don't you? Um, she asked you because you say that everyone should. And she has not said that. That's the thing. It, it's amazing. I, I love the Bernie bros in the audience. who are just like, yeah, Bernie saying Martha McCallum should pay more taxes. She's not running for president. She did not suggest a wealth tax. You did. It is. It, so he's running away from the implications of his own program because this is what all socialists do in the end. They sort of like their lifestyle. But they don't want to and they don't want to sacrifice it. But they do want to seem as though they care a lot about government expenditures and tax rates. You have these wings, AOC and her group on one side. It's like five people. No, it's the progressive group. It is comprehensive. It is thoughtful. It is compassionate. And it is extremely economically strategic as well. But House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, in an interview with Politico, referred to it as the green dream or whatever they call it. Nobody knows what it is, but they're for it, right? But I do know that it's enthusiastic and we welcome all the enthusiasms that are out there. The fact that she set up a climate change commission panel uh, and didn't even put AOC on the panel. There are Democrats who will get in our way from saving ourselves, too. Amazon made the stunning decision Thursday to ditch plans to build a second headquarters in New York. I think it's incredible. 25,000 jobs at $150,000 is what was promised. Justice Democrats launched the DCCC blacklist to stand up to what they say is the bullying of the progressive movement. If you're a one-term Congress member, so what? Your thoughts. She's a badass. Oh, Man. oh my God. Yes. Yay. I love yes. that. Wow. And as I say to some of the new members coming in, I don't know what your issue is, but being a liberal from San Francisco, I got that sign in my basement. I carried it 30 years ago. Ilhan Omar, now facing an extraordinary public admonishment from her own party for several controversial comments about Israel's supporters and American politics. I, yes, I tweeted, there's a response. You can run that and have a nice day. CARE was founded after 9-11 because they recognized that some people did something my sister, Ilhan Omar, she what she was talking about was uplifting people. We have serious work to do. The Democrats have become the party of those three freshman congressmen of far left views from very, very blue indigo districts. Uh, whatever orientation they came to Congress with, they know that we have to hold the center, that we have to be, go down the mainstream. They know that? They do. But it doesn't look like that. It looks as if it, you're, it's fractured. Any other field, it's not okay, it's terrible, the millionaires are destroying this country, too many millionaires and billionaires, unless you write a best-selling book. What is it about best-selling books? Let me tell you something, there are a lot of best-selling books. Most of them are completely worthless. Bernie Sanders' book is completely worthless. He has added very little to society by producing that book. He's probably just damaged some forests by wasting trees. Does anyone really believe that Bernie Sanders' book has made a greater contribution to society, has improved the lives of people more than the car company or the vacuum cleaner company or 
any of the other companies, any enterprise that allows people to thrive and buy goods and services for their friends and family. That's an amazing excuse. So I knew Bernie was a millionaire. I mean, I knew he wrote the book, so I knew he was a millionaire. But moreover, I knew Bernie was a millionaire because he just, he just protests a little too much about socialism. This is the funny thing with socialism. The, the other, we were talking about this. I was talking to sweet little Elisa about this. And she said, but Mac, if Bernie's a big socialist, shouldn't he give away all of his money? Of course he should. Sweet, sweet, sweet little Elisa. Of course, you're thinking too rationally. You're thinking too logically. You're accepting the premises of socialists at face value and following their ideas to a logical conclusion. That's not what socialism is about at all. That is certainly not what socialism is about. Socialism is not about giving away wealth. Socialism is about the acquisition of wealth. It is never about sharing wealth. Sharing wealth is called charity. People who want to share their wealth give money away to charity. They give it to the bum on the street. They give it to their church. They give it to nonprofit organizations and charities. Socialism is about accumulation. It's about the accumulation of wealth and the accumulation of power. It's about saying, ooh, too many people have too many things out there. We are going to not give anything away. We're going to take that wealth away from them and concentrate it in the hands of a, a small number of people also known as the government. That's socialism. Conservatives think there's some contradiction with millionaire socialists. No, of course a socialist is going to be a millionaire. All a socialist is concerned with is taking money, bringing in money, accumulating money. You'll notice most of the people who are pushing socialism are extremely wealthy. Bernie Sanders is a millionaire. All of the leaders of the Democrat party are millionaires. Hillary Clinton, multi-multi-millionaire huge slush funds. That's what socialism does. It's, it's about taking in, bringing in. That's not even an irony. We know it from the beginning. This is what, uh, this is what Winston Churchill said. He said that socialism is the philosophy of failure, the creed of ignorance, and the gospel of envy. It's all about greed. It's not about charity at all. If you like charity, then you give to charity. You, you actually don't want someone stealing your money because you know that they're not going to put it to nearly as good a use as you are going to put it to. Socialism at no point engages the faculties of charity or empathy or generosity. Not, none of those things. It exclusively engages avarice, greed, and envy and acquisitiveness. The great example, Dinesh D'Souza used to use this example all the time. If I'm walking along the street, I'm walking on the sidewalk here and I see some bum and he's some just degenerate, drug addled, lazy bum and he, I'm eating a sandwich and he says, hey, can I, have, can I have that sandwich? I like my sandwich. I've got my sandwich here. But I say, you know, here, here's half my sandwich. Now, I am glad that I have done some charity. I've treated you with compassion you have a gratitude toward me because I've given you a sandwich that I didn't need to give you. And there's a nice moral exchange that happened. On the flip side, I'm walking down the street, do to do to do eating my sandwich. Then millionaire Bernie Sanders comes up on his white horse and he points a gun at my head and he says, give him that sandwich. I say, you give him your sandwich. You're the millionaire. You give him a sandwich. No, no, you, you give him your sandwich right now. So then I got to give the bum my sandwich. I resent the bum for taking my sandwich. I certainly resent Bernie Sanders for making me do it. The bum isn't grateful to me. The bum, I guess, is sort of grateful or at least dependent on Bernie Sanders. And he's, he feels entitled to my sandwich. His only attitude toward me is one of entitlement, as though he deserves my sandwich. And, and Bernie Sanders, it cost him nothing. Millionaire Bernie. That's socialism for you. And Bernie is exposing it. And by the way, it is not going to change one single voter's calculation. People who think, ha ha, yes, now Bernie is exposed as a millionaire. Yes, this will show that he's a hypocrite. No, it won't. In a narrow way, it will. But socialists don't care about that. So socialists do not want to share the wealth. Socialists want to take the wealth. And Bernie is a prime example of that. Take the wealth by any means necessary, even if it means 
contradicting your public statements for 40 years. Western civilization. It's been around for a while, but suddenly everybody is talking about it. Some are anxious to save it. Others are happy to see it go. But what exactly is Western civilization? Is it the great cathedrals of Europe or the Nazi concentration camps? Is it the freedom secured in the US Constitution or chattel slavery? Life-saving medicines or poison gas? The left likes to focus on the bad, genocide, slavery, environmental destruction. But those have been present in every civilization from time immemorial. The positives are unique to the West. Religious tolerance, abolition of slavery, universal human rights, the development of the scientific method. These are accomplishments of a scope and scale that only the West can claim. These aren't the only achievements that make the West special and uniquely successful. As Western thought evolved, it secured the rights of women and minorities, lifted billions of people out of poverty, and invented most of the modern world. Progress hasn't been a straight line, of course, but the arc of history is clear. The obvious proof is that the world is overwhelmingly Western. And, with few exceptions, those parts of the world that aren't aspire to be. Why? Why has Western civilization been so successful? There are many reasons, but the best place to start is with the teachings and philosophies that emerged from two ancient cities, Jerusalem and Athens. Jerusalem represents religious revelation as manifested in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the beliefs that a good God created an ordered universe and that this God demands moral behavior from his paramount creation, man. The other city, Athens, represents reason and logic as expressed by the great Greek thinkers, Plato and Aristotle and many others. These two ways of thinking, revelation and reason, live in constant tension. Judeo-Christian religion posits that there are certain fundamental truths handed down to us by a transcendent being. We didn't invent these truths, we received them from God. The rules he lays down for us are vital for building a functioning moral civilization and for leading a happy life. Greek thinking posits that we only know truth by what we observe, test, and measure. It is not faith but fact that drives our understanding and exploration of the universe. Western civilization, and only Western civilization, has found a way to balance both religious belief and human reason. Here's how the balance works. The Judeo-Christian tradition teaches that God created an ordered universe and that we have an obligation to try to make the world better. This offers us purpose and suggests that history moves forward. Most pagan religions taught the opposite, that the universe is illogical and random and that history is cyclical. History just endlessly repeats itself, in which case, why bother to innovate or create anything new? Second, Judeo-Christian tradition teaches that every human is created in the image of God. That is, each individual's life is infinitely valuable. This seems self-evident to us now, but only because we have lived with this belief for so long. The far more natural belief is that the strong should subjugate the weak, which is precisely what people did in nearly every society in all of history. Only by recognizing the divine in others did we ever move beyond this amoral thinking toward the concern for human rights, democracy, and free enterprise that characterized the West. But Judeo-Christian religion alone didn't build our modern civilization. We also required Greek reason to teach us objective observation that man has the capacity to search beyond revelation for answers. Greek reason brought us the notion of the natural law, the idea that we could discover the natural purpose, the telos, of everything in creation by looking to its character. Human beings were created with the unique capacity to reason. Therefore, our telos was to reason. By investing reason with so much power, Greek thought became integral to the Western mission. Nowhere is this more perfectly expressed than in the American Revolution, in which the founding fathers took the best of the European Enlightenment with its roots in Greek thought and the best of Judeo-Christian practice with its roots in the Bible and melded them into a whole new political philosophy. Without Judeo-Christian values, we fall into scientific materialism, the belief that physical matter is the only reality, and therefore also fall into nihilism, the belief that life has no meaning, that we are merely stellar dust in a cold universe. Without Greek reason, we fall into fanaticism, the belief that fundamentalist adherence to unprovable principles represents the only path toward meaning. The Soviet Union, Communist China, and other socialist tyrannies rejected faith, and murdered 100 million people in the 20th century. Much of the modern Muslim world has embraced faith, but rejected reason. 
It's noteworthy that when the Muslim world did embrace Greek reason from the 8th to the 14th centuries, it was a leading center for scientific advancement. So again, we need both Jerusalem and Athens, revelation and reason. And yet many want to reject both. These people call themselves progressives. Ironically, they want to take us backwards to a time when man was governed neither by reason nor faith, but by feeling, and therefore back to a time of moral chaos and disorder of feeling over fact. It would be a fatal mistake to follow the progressives. Stick with Athens and Jerusalem. I'm Ben Shapiro, editor of The Daily Wire and author of The Right Side of History for Prager University. Did the disciples of Jesus die for their belief that he had risen from the grave? I actually did my dissertation in an academic book on this, so here's the quick answer. One is we know that all the disciples of Jesus believe they had seen the risen Jesus after his death. So their belief in becoming a Christian was believing that Jesus had risen from the grave. Second, we know that all of the apostles were willing to suffer and willing to die for this belief. How do I know this? Look at Acts 4 and Acts 5. They publicly proclaim Jesus. They're threatened, beaten, and thrown in prison for this conviction. Then what about the evidence that they actually died as martyrs? Well, if you take the 12 disciples, and then you add Paul and James, the brother of Jesus, I think we can argue that four of them, we are on solid ground, died as martyrs. So Peter, we have 10 sources in the first and second century, including two sources in the first century, Clement of Rome, a letter of Clement chapter five, and then John chapter 20, 10 sources confirming he died as a martyr, most likely in Rome. Take the apostle Paul. I think we have eight sources from the first and second century that unanimously agree on this. James, the brother of John, we have Acts 12 2, biblical support, he was killed with a sword, and then Christian testimony in the second century. And then James, the brother of Jesus, we actually have support in the first century by Josephus, and then multiple Christian sources and Gnostic sources in the second century. So I think those four were on solid ground. When you get to Andrew and Thomas, now you're dealing with the second and third century. So you could argue it's more probable than not, but the evidence is a little weaker that they actually died as martyrs. The rest of the apostles, I think the evidence is late, contradictory, and hard to know where history ends and where legend begins. So did this undermine their testimony? The answer is no, because what matters is from the earliest record on, they believed they had seen the risen Jesus, and they were willing to publicly proclaim this, put themselves in harm's way because of this conviction. What that tells me is the disciples didn't make this up. They're not liars. They really believed that Jesus had risen from the grave, and they were willing to die for that conviction. Thank <laughs> you.